Richard from Steve Kaufman uh, on uh, Apache Plume. Steve was one of the original members. Nah, I'm a lot fun. Steve was one of the original members of Chicago uh, Hadoop user group and then he dropped all the base of the editor. <laughs> and now he's reappearing Hi. again. Hi. So, go. Uh, hi everybody, uh, my name is uh, Steve Hoffman and um, I'm going to talk about Apache Bloom. Uh, so first about me, uh, I'm going to give a talk, you know, it's, it's just too loud. Um, so whenever you give a talk about yourself, for some reason they always uh, throw out your Twitter handle as if the you know, coffee you drink or sandwiches you eat or if particularly interest to anybody, but um, that's my contact information that basically takes to my LinkedIn page if you want to get a hold of me. Um, I posted the slides to uh, SlideShare. Uh, there's a link at the end um, if uh, you want to refer to any of the stuff later. Uh, don't worry about this because the video is going to be uploaded to kind of user group. Okay. Uh, but don't forget to send the slides to Jim. The slides to Jim. Yeah. Okay. He will pause the Is this working? Is this thing working? Okay. Yes. And uh, I apologize, we didn't anticipate so many people, so we are out of pizza. <laughs> Whoever got it, got lucky. Yeah, so 147 people responded. Clearly, there's not 147 people here, but, you know, so in the past, I think they've ordered pizza for like everybody, and they've just wound up with tons of pizza Pizza at the end when they wound up getting half as many people. Yeah, I'm not trying to lose weight here in like the yes, currently. So I'm not trying to cut the pizza. Talk so, about Jim's weight. So uh, um, I work at Orbitz. Uh, you guys may have heard that we're you know local local startup started about 14 years ago. Um, we were recently uh, named one of the best places to work, and when, also whenever you give a big data talk, you have to say you're hiring, which of course we are. Uh, not just for big data, but. It's a good place to work if uh, you're looking for a place in Chicago. Um, and then, of course, the real the real reason I'm here is because apparently I know something about Flume. Uh, I wrote this book, um, which has garnered a whopping six six reviews on uh, Amazon. It was five. I had to change it. Um, anyway, I still work for a living like everybody else. All right, so. Uh, What's the deal with Flume? Why do I need this, right? Um, Flume started as a, a project out of Cloudera um, to fill a need, and then they open sourced it, right? It's I have to get data into Hadoop. I can't just, you know, write to it. It's a Java program. You need a special client. You can't really mount it unless you do some crazy stuff with libhdfs, and then permissions never work. Where's my? I need to know that. And so you, you need something that basically sits in front of it to get a bunch of data. Offer it up, write a chunk, close the file. Meanwhile, you're still reading more data, and that's basically what Flume does. Um, so the architecture is pretty simple. I took this from the uh, the Flume user guide, which is on the Apache website. Um, I'll refer to this a bunch of times. Uh, but at the core of it, you, Flume is effectively just a, a Java program that has some inputs and some outputs. Usually, your input is your logs or anything really and on the other end you have the target in this case it's usually HDFS um, but you know, again if you, if you Google around you'll find lots of implementations for both uh, the inputs and the outputs uh, for just about anything that stores data um, so at the core of uh, at, at uh, so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna go through each of these pieces, and uh, by the end, you guys will know as much as me. Uh, so every bit of data uh, in Flume terms is called an event. Uh, it's pretty pretty straightforward. It has two parts, um, some headers, and then an arbitrary body, which is just represented as a byte array. Um, you know, most of the time we talk about logs, but really you can you can transport anything. This could be the images, it could be whatever that you might be doing your processing on. And then the headers exist really just to sort of apply some you know, context to the to the payload so that you know as you kind of move the data around you know everybody doesn't have to inspect the data and know how to interpret the data you just kind of set it in the headers and query the headers um, so for example here's a you know a line of an Apache log 
uh, as a string, but it might look like the bottom part there uh, as a flume uh, event where you know, here, here I've got a couple headers, one's you know, time of the events represented as a, 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 an epoch time, and you know, like the header where the, you know, which host it came from, things like that. And then the byte array is just, you know, as you can see, it's just a bunch of bytes. Um, the, uh, the data inside of the agent uh, gets, does the handoff through this thing called the channel. You can have multiple channels within an agent, um, and there's pretty much two types, right? Whether it's a transient channel or a durable channel, right? Transient, it's held in memory, and if you restart it or the machine crashes, the data's gone. Um, and a durable channel, which is usually backed by the file system, there's a JVC implementation. I don't know why you would use JVC to hold your stuff um, as opposed to just putting on the file system, but it's there. Um, uh, but the idea behind the channel really is that uh, it gives you, you have to think about how big is this thing, right? Because you don't have infinite resources, you don't have infinite disk, you don't have infinite RAM, you have to kind of decide how much you're gonna hold in your, you know, how much you can hold in the channel because you don't want to overload the system. Uh, so getting the data into the channel is pretty straightforward. You, you use this uh, thing called the source. There's lots of implementations of the source. Uh, but the idea is that it receives data, or it fetches data, um, depending on the particular implementation, and creates events and drops them into the channel, and then goes and gets more. Uh, a lot of times you, you'll you see you know, common sources are things like the HTTP source or a syslog source where it's just listening on a well-known port, and you connect to it and you push data to it. Um, but there are also uh, implementations of the source for instance, there's uh, something called the exec source, which will let you run an arbitrary command, like you know, run some shell script or whatever that you've got on the system, take the output, and that becomes the event. Um, and then you can give the periodic, uh, you know, how often you want it to run. So it can be either a push or a pull. Uh, it's kind of up to you which way works better for you. Everybody with me so far? Pretty straightforward, right? So on the other end, oh, and one more thing on the sources is that um, you can write them to one or more channels. Uh, I'll talk about this more in a second. Um, on the other end, you've got uh, sinks, um, which is what they call the output. And this is just a separate thread that picks something up off the channel, tries to send it to the target. If it works, it deletes it from the channel. And if it's not, it leaves it there and it tries again later. Um, pretty straightforward, right? All right, all of this is driven through uh, a simple configuration. We're going to go through some configuration examples. Um, it's a good, you, you kind of need to know how to do this, uh, even when you're using uh, um, something like the uh, Cloud Air Manager. And I'll show you this in a second. Um, but it's basically just a, a, a property file uh, that sits on the machine. It's pretty easy to set up. Uh, every agent gets, it, you, when, you, when you start up, you have to say the name of this agent is something. Right? If you use the Cloudera packages, that name is just agent. So all the properties here, you'll see, I'm going to use this as an example, have start with agent dot. Right? And if you decide to manage your configuration you know, where all your different agent types are all in one giant file and you push that file everywhere, when you start it up, you say you are this agent A, you are agent B, and it'll pick the right configuration. Um, most of the time, you don't do that because you would use tools like um, Chef or Puppet to push around individual files. So, anyway, the the name uh, the name thing is you know something that they did um, probably for uh, testing purposes so you could run multiple agents and watch the handoff on a single machine. But most of the time you don't run more than one on one one on a machine. <clears throat> so at the bottom here uh, there are these three sort of bootstrap properties. Uh, it's a sources list, a sinks list, and a channel list. Um, so when you start up and you say Start name agent, it's going to look for agent.sources, agent.sync, and it's basically just a list of names. Um, these are just arbitrary things here. I'm just calling R1, K1, and C1. Um, from there, it looks for a property called agent.sources. whatever the name was, and it goes through each of them and looks for a dot type. And so this is how it kind of knows what to start up. Right? So in this case, I have 
Um, and here, so for instance, this R1 type is SEQ. This is a source called, it's a, it's a, a sequence number generator. It just creates events, one, two, three, four, and injects them into the channel. It's mostly used for testing purposes. Um, whenever you see a short name like this, it's, a, it's usually a built-in alias to some class that's in the Fluent implementation. If you write your own custom one, you, or use one that's not standard, you'll see a fully qualified class name uh, as the type. So it runs through all of the, uh, so in this case we've got a sequence generator in the source. It's uh, logger is just output to you know, log for j, and uh, here I'm using a memory channel. Um, the other important property uh, here is that you have to specify how to kind of wire these together, right? So your source, you have to specify the list of channels. In this case, there's only one. Um, note it's channels plural because the source can write to more than one channel, whereas a sync can only read from one channel because you know it's his job to actually delete the records. Um, everybody with me so far? This is how it all connects up, right? And then of course you got um, here I've just shown one property, but every one of these uh, uh, different sources and sinks and whatnot have lots and lots of properties. Here I'm specifying the, the size of the channel is uh, a thousand, a thousand records, right? Um, and again, everything is you know prefixed with the particular um, you know component type dot name dot property. Right? Go with me. Easy peasy, right? Um, so all this stuff is in the in the user guide uh, on the Apache website. Uh, of course, you can also look at my book if you like. Um, thank you very much if you have purchased my book or intend to. Um, so, um, but one thing you want, you know, even even with all of the documentation, you know, sometimes there's mistakes. Um, one of the things that I learned uh, as I was doing the book that sometimes there's a discrepancy for a default value between, like. You know what the documentation says and what the code actually does. Um, so a lot of times, if you're, it's a good idea just to specify what you want instead of just always relying on the default. Um, so anyway, it's all in the patch page. So if you guys can see this, oh, I guess you can. So I ran, I started this up. I stripped off a bunch of the, you know, time stuff. Uh, but basically, you can kind of see it, you know, going through uh, the startup. Basically, how I describe it, right? It it starts up each of the sort of channel, sources, the sinks, links everything up. This one line here where it says starting new configuration with all the stuff, it's kind of a one line um, thing that kind of shows you the state of everything, right? The sources, the sinks, and, and what's going on. And then after this, you see events coming through because um, this is the sequence generator starting 0, 1, 2, and so on. Um, and then the logging sync, just printing it out to log for j In this case, it prints out the headers, which is blank because we didn't set any. We'll get to that in, in a bit. Um, sort of the hex representation and then the, the actual string representation on the other side. Um, I think this only shows like the first 16 characters for obvious reasons. It's for debugging only. Um, but if there's, but you know, you, you still, the, re the reason I pointed this out is you kind of want to get used to how the startup sequence should look when things are happy because if there's actually an error in your configuration, you forget to wire something, because a lot of this is done through, you know, if you misspell one of the names, it may not actually, you know, wire everything up properly. So, and it, does, it may not necessarily even throw an error. So you kind of want to see everything starting up. Um, otherwise, you'll just be running there and doing nothing as opposed to necessarily throwing an error. Um, all this configuration you can do through Cloud Error Manager, if you use Cloud Error Manager. Um, it's basically the same stuff, it's just in a GUI, right? It, I fire this up and you know, right there at the top there's the name, right? That corresponds to the property file name, and there's the section at the bottom that says, cut and paste this into your editor, right? So, <clears throat> I'm not sure the GUI's really buying you much here, other than other than having a, a mechanism to kind of, you know, drop it in the UI and have it pushed out everywhere. Um, personally, I like to source control all the stuff in Git um, and use if engineer, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Chef or Puppet, but, um, you know, whatever, whatever you prefer is, as long as it gets there. 
um, you know, maybe cut, maybe cut or build like, like a, you know, Lego GUI kind of snap together thing one day, um, and it'll be more interesting. <clears throat> All right, so as I mentioned, if you if you're gonna sort of send your data to multiple locations, you have to have multiple channels. Um, kind of like this picture represents. Um, and you can also do things like, uh, you know, passing from one agent to the other. If it makes sense, you might have maybe different data centers. Yes? What do you mean by different locations? Different directories or? Sorry? What do you mean by different locations? Well, different directories? Different, well, different targets. So for instance, it, like in this picture, here, this example is showing we're writing the data to HDFS or some subset of the data to HDFS. We're also sending it to JMS. We're also sending it to this other machine. That's what I mean by other other destinations. And if I want to write to multiple directories in <coughs> HDFS, those are still considered to be different. Right. Right. Yeah. So the question was if I want the, the data in different directories in HDFS, because apparently you have lots and lots of storage at your disposal. But um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you may you may actually write you different different gotcha. bits into different different uh, parts of HDFS. Each of those would be considered a different target, um, a different sync, and they would have a different channel. So basically, target is HDFS directory in the case of HDFS. It can be an HDFS directory. It could be a database. It could be whatever Mongo, whatever. Can I write to HBase directory? And there is also an HBase sync. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I I'll get into the uh, the details of how you I'll get into the details of how you how you do this in, in, in a few slides. It, actually, it's the next slide. So, um, so when you there's this thing called the channel selector, right? If you if you specify more than one um, source, or I'm sorry, more than one channel on your source, you know what what does that mean, right? Does it mean each channel gets a copy, only some of them get a copy? So you you specify it. If you don't specify, you get the this first type, which is called the replicating one. It basically means every channel listed gets a copy of the event, right? Um, but there's this other one called multiplexing, which is, you know, based on the value of the value of like a header, you can decide send it to this one or that one. Um, and of course, you can always write your own, um, like all good open source projects. Uh, so here's an example of the replicating. You know, in this example, I've listed three channel sounds. The the type replicating is. Um, is uh, the default, you don't have to specify it, but is that for completeness? Yes? Uh, what is happening if I wire multiple sources to the same channel? Are they going to be all mixed up, or the channel is intelligent enough to... Yeah, so I probably should have mentioned this. So there's no guarantee of order for your events. Um, so if you had multiple sources writing to the same channel, that's okay. Um, because the channel really is about the, the destination, right? So you could have things coming in from, um, you know, different different places, uh, and they wind up in the same channel, right? But obviously, you want to make sure that you deal with things like, you know, are is the data is it the same kind of data, right? Because you're going to be possibly writing two different formats of data to the same place, or dealing with it that way, right? Um, let's take a specific example. I have two web servers yes. that are writing their logs to the same channel. Are they going to be intermixed? Or right, so if, if you have two web servers, so the question was if I have two web servers going to the same channel, your web server is probably going to send the data to um, your, a, a source that you have running on this agent. They're probably going to connect to the same socket. 
right? Uh, I, I mean to load files of two web servers. I can't load balanced web servers. Right. Both logs are coming to the same channel. Can I tell which serve, which log record belongs to which server? Or there's always getting... Uh, well, I'll show you an example of this when we get a little bit further on. Um, yeah. Well, I I I think I think I'll come back to this question because I I do discuss this a bit. So, so again in this example, uh, if I configured it this way, all three channels would get a copy of the record. You can also specify optional, which means um, if you get an error right appending to the channel, like let's say it was full, it won't return an error to the source, right? And kind of bubble up bubble the error up the chain. Um, clear? Okay, and then the flip side of this is the multiplex say this is where you say, okay, I'm going to multiplex across, in this case, I have four channels. Um, and let's say I had a, a header called currency. And if the currency value for that record was US dollars, I want to put on channel one. And if it's euros, put a copy on two and three. And if it doesn't match anything, it goes to the default, which would be channel four. Yeah, appreciate it. So what will happen if you write to a JBoss queue? Say again? Let's say we write to a JBoss queue. If you write to a JBoss queue, it's a JMS queue. Well, in, 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 this particular, in this case, I'm talking about the writing from the source to the channel. And the channel is either, this is all happening within the Flume agent. Right, so I'm talking about the other scenario. From yeah, the scenario I haven't gotten right to the queue. Right? Yeah, I haven't gotten to the output yet. Okay, okay, we'll come back to this. So the question now becomes, you know, I want to do switch. If I want to do switching like this on headers, where do the headers come from? Some sources create the headers automatically. So for instance, if you use a syslog header, there are things in a syslog packet that are common, like there's time and there's the server it came from, things like that. Though the source, the implementation of the source will set headers for you for that stuff. Um, but you might want to do it yourself, and that's where this uh, thing calls, called an interceptor comes in. There's, um, you can have, uh, and you can think of interceptors kind of like, if you're familiar with like servlet chains or, or um, uh, AOP method interceptors, right? It's basically a chain of things that you can insert between the source and the channel to either to inspect the event, right, and possibly transform it, and one gets passed to the other. Um, so you can have zero or more as you go to the channel, and zero or more as it comes out. Usually, the stuff that comes in, you kind of normalize the data, right, or add, add things like every event should have a timestamp, you decide, so you make sure that you do that on the way in. On the way out, you might use interceptors to maybe do some little transformations to make the data more consumable by the particular um, sync implementation. Um, you can have both or neither. Um, if you implement it yourself, it, for those familiar with Java, it, it looks like this. You get a, a list of events and you return a list of events. If you want to drop something because it looks like garbage to you, you could do it easily in an interceptor. Um, you simply return null, um, not, except for the list one. You don't want to return you don't want to return a list that contains null because it doesn't like that. You just want to take it out of the list. Um, so here's an example of interceptor chain, right? So using the same configuration, you you say name of the agent dot source or sync, right? Dot the name dot interceptors equals the list, right? And again, this is just some arbitrary list. You can call it whatever you want. Make it something meaningful. Um, here I'm just saying I one two and three. And again, it looks for a dot type on each of these, right? So I once type is timestamp, and these are a bunch of built-in ones that I'm showing here. Um, timestamp, as you might suspect, suspect, creates a timestamp header if one doesn't exist. It's got configuration properties like preserve existing, so it won't overwrite it if it already exists, things like that. Again, look at the documentation. Um, this static one is just I want a specific key and value added to the header, right? So in this case, I'm saying, oh, I want a header called data center. It's called CHI. 
Um, and this might be a way to determine, you know, maybe which region it's coming from or whatever, right? It's just a way to stack this out of header to kind of do something, some decision with it further down the chain. Um, and then there's this host header, which is, you know, whatever host I'm running on, set the thing. So this might be, you know, this is how you might set, you might automatically get the name of the server that, you know, it went through. In this case, I call the relay host because, you know, depending on how you configure your, um, your, your agents and how many handoffs you do, um, you, know, you make, basically make it whatever is meaningful to you. So after it runs through this, my headers might look like this at the bottom. Yes, Boris. So I1, I2, I3 is the order, right? Right, so the order is the order that's listed on that first line. And right. uh, if I have more than one I1, order is on the third? Well, the names have to be unique, right? So if you call it I I1, it's just some arbitrary name that you pick. Right, but you have two I1s. No, I don't. I have. So the, the list is the first line right. that just says there are these three, go look for these three. And that says i1.type is timestamp. The next line, i1.preserve existing, is a is an additional parameter to the timestamp interceptor. Okay. Right? And then i2.type, right? So again, a lot of these have default settings, but um, you know, this this is is I that's very bizarre. How's it bizarre? Is it bizarre? It's pretty obvious, right? All right. Yeah? So are you filtering which hosts or what type of logs go to which channel by this? Well, is static host and timestamp unique to certain types? Or are they well, so, so these three particular interceptors that I've shown here are just examples of um, things you can do. In, in this case, they just set headers, right? You can, you can create you can have um, an interceptor that might actually transform or drop the, the, the body, the payload of the message as well. Um, but often the, the, the interceptors are just kind of the most common way to kind of add or remove headers. Okay. So basically you set these interceptors based on what agents they come from, right? And if I have an agent in the US, I can have an agent in the UK, I can add these interceptors on those agents and add this Yes, yes. You, 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 but you know, again, you would only you would only set the header if you're going to use the header for something, right? Um, it, you know, the, in this case, I you know, like I would probably not set the data center unless I was trying to do specific, you know, routing. Um, meaning, like I might have a, a multiplexing um, source. A select, you know, channel selector, where it comes in, it looks at it, and says, "Oh, this is from the EU. I'm going to send it to down this path. Otherwise, I'm going to send it down this path. Right? Otherwise, there's no point in sending that. It's just more processing overhead." Yeah. So, are these in, what you're showing here is basically always addition of new headers, and we'll get into later the conditional logic and how you transform. Yeah, so in, in these examples, I'm showing addition of header, but you can remove headers as well in an interceptor. You, you can, because the interceptor call looks like this, an event comes in, an event comes out, you can pretty much morph it any way you want. It's just these are kind of the out of the box, you know, canned useful ones. Like, I expect my thing to have a timestamp, so they created a timestamp interceptor just to make it easy for you, right? To add a timestamp header. Um, if you wanted to remove a header, you can do that. But um, unless you're actually going to store the raw event with the headers, and we'll get to that in a bit, um, you know, you could just ignore. You don't really have to remove the headers if, at the end, all you store is the body and you ignore the headers, right? So I always think of the body as like the thing that is actually going to the destination, and the headers are just there to kind of help it along. Space. All right, everyone with me still? Yeah, right. one comment. Uh, yes. The microphone there is so that you can pass it to the people that talk, not just hold on. Okay. Pass the mic around if you have a question. 
Um, so a, a recent addition that I haven't played with yet um, that was on the Cloud Air blog, they used this with the, the, um, with the uh, Cloud Air search stuff, is this thing called the Morph Line, which is like a, it's almost like another language where you, uh, a, like a library of functions, like here I'm showing this convert timestamp, and you kind of chain them together. This is a, a picture I took from their, um, from their blog where they're, they're kind of showing data coming in on a, on a, on a, uh, like a source, like a syslog source. It goes to this morph line sync. There's also an interceptor version of it. And you, you, you basically pass it this little script. And it's the same thing as an interceptor chain. I, I kind of think of it kind of like when you write a MapReduce job in like your favorite scripting language and you used to do streaming. That, you don't want to write it in Java and have to basically bake it into the, the agent. This is a way to make it a little more scripty. Um, I haven't played with this, but um, all the Clutter search stuff is based on it, so it's probably something you want to look into. Um, OK. So um, I'm going to take a little sidestep here and talk a little bit about Avro. Anybody use Avro? Actually, I should ask this at the beginning. Who uses Foom right now? Couple, awesome. Um, so, Avro, uh, Avro, if you haven't uh, messed around with it, it's it's basically a, a serialization format. It's it came, it's another you know Doug cutting turns uh, open source type project. Um, it's a storage format and it's a, a wire protocol. Uh, and if you're familiar with like protobufs, it's kind of you know, in that same camp. Uh, but the the idea is that the the the, the structure, the schema of the data is kind of stored with the, um, the data itself. So it's kind of nice for Hadoop for several reasons, right? If you store your data and you come back later in five years, the format of your data might have changed. You're not necessarily going to go back and rework all your data into a different format. So if it gives you a way to sort of write this, the, the structure of the data with the data at the time to write it, and then if you change it later, you've got new data, it's in a different format, and it just kind of knows what to do. Um, it, it also is uh, splittable, right, for app news fans. Um, you know, if you have your text files and you gzip them, and you stick them in HTTPS and run a job, you know, map, the, 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 the map produce code doesn't necessarily know where the record boundaries are because you've, you've crushed the file and it doesn't know where each record ends. And so the difference here is that instead of compressing like the container, you, you compress the data and then put it in the container that has very nice boundaries. It's, it's based loosely on the, the sequence file, but um, anyway, it's very binary friendly, uh, especially if you have things, even if, even if you don't use binary, you know, if you're storing like JSON or whatever, it's got carriage returns in it, you know, that kind of conflicts with this notion it's sort of uh, the, the traditional uh, Unix uh, philosophy where you use like the graph and each record is one line. Well, what if your record is multiple lines, right? It, that kind of breaks down. So this, this gives you a way to kind of deal with that. When you write a MapReduce job, it's um, instead of getting a line of text that your mapper might parse, you actually just get the scheme. You actually just get a, an object that's um, in the structure, so it's kind of nice. It's probably worth looking into if you haven't messed around with it. The reason I mention it is because um, it's it's uh, it's actually how um, Flume. If you go from Flume agent to Flume agent, they have you, you know obviously you can do it however you want, but out of the box they have this Avro source and sync that you can use in the handoff, and it's pretty easy to configure. It's pretty brain dead. It's not like you. Nobody has to know what the format of the data is going from one to the other. You just point it at the host and the port, and everything just goes across. It's pretty straightforward. Um, the most recent versions uh, do support um, um, compressing the payload, too, uh, which is nice. Um, so your configuration might look something like this if you're, if you're going from, from one agent to the other. You know, it's pretty straightforward. I got sync foo on the left and um, source bar on the right. <laughs> um, here I've called it uh, data from foo. I don't know why. That's what I called it. Um, 
So it's pretty straightforward, and, and I've configured it to, to use uh, deflate compression. Um, any questions on this? Pretty straightforward. Uh, obviously, you need to make sure that if you compress it on one end, if you tell it the data is compressed on one end, it has to kind of match up on the other. Um, that's really the only um, um, restriction. Um, so why am I mentioning this, right? Uh, so you remember that, that picture back at the beginning where we've got this web server and it's pushing data to the source? Um, I, one of the things that uh, you can include um, in your program, if you're writing a Java program, is there's this log4j Avro sync which you configure to point at. It, it basically acts as a, as a sync within your program, but not necessarily sucking in the entire Hadoop ecosystem, right? Um, because the wire protocol is kind of um, it's kind of version independent, you you don't run into situations where like if you had stuck the Hadoop client right in your program, and you deploy this to a thousand machines, and you decide, oh, I'm going to upgrade my Hadoop cluster. And now there's an incompatibility between the client and the, and the server, which isn't so much a problem uh, as it used to be. They're, they've got better about backward compatibility at the wire protocol level in Hadoop. But um, a way to isolate yourself from that, that change is, is to basically use Avro serialization, and then you can version those two things independently. Um, all the things that you would normally expect to see in a, in a log4j message, like category, and log level, and all that other junk, just become headers within the events. Um, and then the message is, it becomes the body, right? The, uh, the configuration, so the first bit is uh, the log4j configuration. So here, I specified this appender called flume. I pointed at this uh, log4j appender. You have to include this uh, flume ng SDK um, library in the project. That's how it gets the, the appender class. You give the host name and the ports. Uh, unsafe mode, I think, uh, is I'm not exactly sure why this is um, the default is false, but uh, I think this means if uh, if it can't write it because you try to let's say the channel that you're running to is full um, on the machine that you're sending it to, uh, it actually returns an error. I don't know what you're going to do with an error if you're logging. Um, so unsafe basically means just drop it. Yeah. Two questions. Um, where's the Avro schema file for this thing? Like, can you, uh, where would the Avro schema file for um, so for this particular stuff, so uh, for this particular stuff, the log4j talking to um, um, the Avro source that would be receiving this, um, the schema's kind of fixed, right? It's headers and a body, right? Um, in terms of uh, storing it in Avro, uh, that's in the sync part, like when you write to HTTPS. Well, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, it's, a, it's actually one of the things that, um, um, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. No. Stretching, all right. <clears throat> um, and then on the receiver, you know, you just say, you open an Avro source, you say, buy to all IPs, give a port, and write to whatever channel you're going to. <clears throat> Um, the other sort of flip side of this uh, is um, when you start up the Flume program, there's actually two different ways you can start it. You can run it in agent mode, which is what we've talked about, the runs as daemon. But there's also a, a, an Avro client parameter that you can give it as an example of it here. And this is a very handy way to basically inject data in. Um, I've, I use it mostly for testing, but you know, if, it, it can also be used for any kind of sort of legacy process that you have where, you know, if you have this cron job or whatever that you know, exports data from the database, dumps it in a file, you use this to kind of then shove it into the pipe and it'll show up where it's supposed to show up on the other end. Mm -hmm. um, rather than kind of faring it the rest of the way, you reuse the, the pipes that you're setting up for all the other sort of real-time feeds. Um, if you don't give it a, you know, if you don't give the dash f parameter, it just reads from standard in, so it's very user friendly. You just do your thing, pipe to this command, and it'll send it. Pretty good. All right. All right. Let's talk about the other side of it now. Any questions on data going in? Yeah. So how So 
some is it a reliable communication? If something happens, something crashes, are we going to lose any units? If if something crashes, well, so in the case of using log for J, a log for J appender that let's say is connecting to another machine that's running the Atmos source, if that machine goes down, then yeah, your log for J writes gonna get an error. There's, there's nowhere to, for the data to go. Um, you can, you know, depending on how much data you produce, how much logs you produce, you might, you know, in your implementation of log for J, you might use like a uh, like an async appender that has some buffering. Um, but you know, ultimately, if it's if it's down for a long time, there's just nowhere for it to go. Um, you know, and, and this uh, we'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit about this later. But you know, a lot of the stuff because you're kind of dealing with moving data around and you've got lots of moving parts. Um, you know, this is all still very much uh, a best effort, right? Um, if you know A needs to talk to B and B's not there and you haven't configured, let's say, multiple paths um, for the data to take, then you um, the data, there's just nowhere for the data to go. Um, you know, the sort of the only sure thing is, is uh, and of course, that's also assuming it's up is you really, really never ever need to lose a bit of data. You write it to a database. You wouldn't use something like this. Um, but you know, having a very large database that is super highly available that never goes down ever is very expensive when you're talking about big data scale. And most of the people that I've talked with that consume a lot of the data, like our machine learning guys, um, they're they're okay with losing a little bit here and there um, because they're looking at big patterns, right? So if you've got tons and tons of data and they lose a couple here or there, I mean, obviously you try not to, but sometimes it happens. Um, okay, so uh, the HMS sync, this is just one implementation of the sync. It's the one that's probably um, going to be used the most by you, but you know, as I said, there's lots of sync implementations. Um, I actually just wrote a sync that writes to a MySQL database for some, for some old uh, um, there's a tool chain that read from this database, and rather than rewriting the whole thing, we just wrote a sync that opens a connection to the database and writes the data in the format the old thing wrote it to, and you know, migration complete. So when you write the HFS sync, as the name implies, is to write data in chunks to the HFS file system. Um, it will open a file and write to it until one of three three things happen. They're all configurable. Um, you can set more than one. Uh, either some amount of time passes, some number of records have been written, or some size of data has been written. Um, when any of these is hit, the file is closed, and the next one's open. Um, the configuration looks something like this. Uh, so in this case, I don't know why I call it foo instead of agent, but um, it's sync, sync name, type, HDFS. Uh, the two, the bold is, uh, those are the required fields. Um, so you give it the, the path. And this could be a either a fully qualified, you know, HDFS path. It could be um, you know, an absolute path. It could be a relative path within HDFS. Um, but you know, most if you if you're running the agent, use, let's say using the Cloudera, you know, CDH distribution, it runs as the Flume user, which means you know, and use a relative path. It's going to be in Flume's the Flume user's home directory, which might not be where you want. So I always use the absolute path. Um, this also assumes that you've configured the machine to be a proper um, a new client, right? So when I specify the name, the name node path, it's going to go look in at see Hadoop, um, you know, uh, was it course site that XML or whatever to get the, the path into the, the name node or HDFS uh, that site. Um, so here I've configured um, writing to this uh, data directory, and I'm using a, a dated uh, path. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of uh, escape sequences like this that you can use. Again, it's all in the documentation. Here it's uh, by specifying the, the date, you know, year, month, day, hour. Um, I want the files to begin with the word log. It'll add some gobbledygook like a timestamp or something so that every file is unique. <clears throat> I want the file to end in .avro because 
Um, down below you see the serializer. I'm going to write in the Avro format, and I'm going to use snapping compression. And then I have this uh, in-use prefix. I'll talk about it in a second. Um, so, uh, you know, as the data is writing, I don't know. If, yeah, go ahead. A um, couple of questions. On sure. This. One. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. One. Uh, so the channel has to run on the edge node, right? I'm sorry. So the channel has to run on the edge node, right? Because you are specifying HDFS as the right. directory. So right. it has well, the, to know the, the configuration. The eight, right. The agent has to have a proper Hadoop configuration, right? Which means right. it's it's going to fire up. When you install, if you like install the RPM, it's going to suck. It. It's going to say, "I depend on Hadoop," and it's going to suck all the Hadoop stuff in. And there's a configuration directory for Hadoop that normally you would point it to your name node and your job tracker and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of that's a sort of prerequisite. Right. The second question is: You are using the clever file name that ends in an hour. What if you are trying to write more than one file during a given hour? Well, Was so it part? this is so the path. The path is not the file name. The path is the directory that the data will get written to. So, for instance, if 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 a date if a record came in right now, it would go into data slash two thousand fourteen slash oh three slash what's the date? Whatever. Slash oh nine slash whatever the hour is right slash, and then the file will be log dot something something something, right? So that's the directory. That's not the file name. It's the path is the the path is the directory, and then the file name is constantly changing, and you can specify this prefix. I think if you don't, it's just called like flu data or something like that. Um, but you know, most people don't care about the individual file names since most of the time when you run a map job, you just point at a directory and it takes all the files in the directory. Um, yeah. So to answer Boris's question, yeah. <clears throat> underneath the covers, the HDFS things maintains what calls a bucket writer. The bucket writer is mapping to a path. When the file is being opened, a new timestamp, the timestamp of the event, first event that uh, hit that bucket writer is the full absolute path of the file. So. You will not barf, you'll just end up with multiple files under that path. Yeah, I have a, and, an example of this on this slide. Yeah, and to answer your earlier question, you could use percent um, modifiers to look at items inside the header to create your paths. So you would create okay, buckets so, together, right? Right, yeah. So other than percent Y and things like that, I'm, I'm just showing some date patterns here. You can actually say there's a there's a escape sequence for any arbitrary header name, too, if you want to make that part of the path. Um, so like so here's here's this running. Um, it's writing into the directory. You notice uh, the first file it has zero length and it has that underscore with the dot tmp. So as the file is being written, it's this temp file. Um, the reason I use the underscore for the in use prefix, um, this was added. I Forget exactly when, but if you're, you know, if you think about this, data is always coming in. Somebody might be running a MapReduce job, but MapReduce jobs ignore input files that have dots and underscores in the beginning. So this is a common way to basically have it, you know, if you actually had a zero length input file, MapReduce doesn't like that either. So this is a way to kind of avoid that situation where somebody's running MapReduce, including this directory, which has data being written to it. Meanwhile, Right. Um, so while the file is being written, it's not actually all there. Right. The blocks are being written, and when you close it, then all of a sudden it gets renamed, and you see the, the length. But until then, it's it's still kind of it's not quite there yet. All right. Just like if you were doing a put. Right? <clears throat> so. Um, the, so the event serializer is uh, something that um, this is how you specify the the way that the event gets converted back into whatever the output is, right? So out of the box, these are sort of the three that come out of the box. Uh, I've written my own um, to to write in different ways, but uh, text basically just says take the bytes that make up the body, 
treat it like a GFH string and spit it out one line at a time. If you want the headers too, use the headers and text. Um, and then uh, if you use Avro event, the schema that is actually used by the out of the box Avro event serializer is, a, it looks very much like Flume, right? It has a header, object, which is a map, string of strings, and the body is a byte array, right? So it basically doesn't transform it at all, it just writes it straight out. But it's in an Avro form. If you, if you wanted it to be in a different format you would, and use Avro, you'd probably have to use your own serializer. I believe there is a way to specify, um, uh, off the top of my head I don't remember, but uh, there, is, there, there are other um, serializers where you can like pass it like an Avro schema file and it'll, and it'll do the conversion, but I, I think you actually have to provide the, the, the mapping, right? Because it doesn't necessarily know know how to transform this byte payload into whatever schema you've got. So um, it's going to be a little bit of coding there. So that's where the custom stuff comes in. Um, there's some other stuff about the uh, HDFS stuff that um, I actually forgot to put in the slides um, about doing multiple paths, which is really about like you know more high availability stuff, um, uh, so that you know instead of when you do a handoff from one agent to the other, if one of them is down or being restarted or whatever, because of, for whatever reason, that there's multiple paths to take. Um, sorry, I forgot to put it in the slides. Um, it's 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 on the it's on the um, Apache site. It's also in the book. Um, all right, so let's talk about uh, some some takeaway lessons here. Right? Um, first of all, there are way too many formats for everything. Right. Um, for those familiar with SKCD, uh, this one's making fun of uh, all the various ways of representing time. Um, this is just one tiny example. This, this way, it's, this becomes a very um, annoying problem for the people consuming the data, right? It's very easy to create data. It's very easy to shunt it into HDFS. But then the onus is on the people consuming the data. They have to know how to interpret it. If they're dealing with all these different formats, it's just, it's, it's a pain, right? Um, they, they, that's not what they signed up for, right? So pick some, you know, some, when you're trying to stitch your data together, come up with at least some, some baseline standards around things like the time format, um, um, other things that, other bits of data that you might use to, um, you know, join, you know, this data set with that data set. Even if it's just agreeing on what you're going to call the header names, uh, if, you, if you dump out the uh, the foo headers, um, which of course leads me to the um, the uh, time zones are evil. Uh, if you you know this this data is being consumed by uh, computers, not by people. Daylight savings time has no place. It breaks everything twice a year. Um, this drives me crazy. Uh, so set this dot dash d user time zone to UTC. Um, you want to write all your times using one of the ISO 8601 standards. It's kind of you know the biggest to the smallest unit. Sorting works the way you'd expect it. Um, you know all the time libraries support it. Um, so do that. <laughs> um, so now. So generally speaking, when we're talking about moving data around, this 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 idea of doing this asynchronous handoff, right? You're you're doing a fire and forget. This is kind of what we were talking about with you know not how you make sure you don't lose any records, right? Because you've got something writing to some holding area, um, and you've got something reading, and you run into the weird situations when you've done that, right? Everybody assumes the data will get there, and if everything's keeping up, you're fine. But sometimes you'll, you'll wind up with some weird situations. So this, this, this actually happened to me. So here on the left, we've got our supercomputer um, creating our, uh, our output logs. And on the right, you've got your Flume agent that's tailing the file, right? This is a common syslog paradigm, right? And you're humming along, you're getting lots of traffic. All of a sudden, there's a huge surge in traffic. And the application will do this handoff, right? Where it'll rotate the file. 
Flume's still got the open file descriptor. It's still reading that file. And let's say Hadoop's down, somebody's, you know, more screwed up, you have to reboot the cluster, whatever, right? And so data's not flowing. It's just, or it's going really, really slow. And this new file now starts, right? It's right to the new file because people are still hitting your website. And it persists, right? You've got another rotation going on. <coughs> one becomes two, log dot becomes dot one, creates a new file, and then finally Boris gets the, sorry Boris, uh, gets the, <coughs> gets uh, Hadoop up and running, data's flying again, it finishes with the file, and it says, oh, I'm gonna go get the next file, and boom, you've just missed a whole chunk, right? So there were some assumptions that you made here, right, with this kind of handoff. Um, now you might say, but Steve, this is exactly the architecture of Flume, right? It's, yeah, but it's slightly different, right? The, the, the channel doesn't, like, isn't shifting around. It's not changing its location, and it has bound and size, right? So <clears throat> when the data stops flowing, it fills up, and then the person that's writing the data has to stop or do something, right, different, because there's nowhere else for it to go. Um, so you want to kind of avoid these kind of situations. Uh, you're probably familiar with this if you do like, you know, chained map reduce jobs, right? You've got some job that runs at 9 a.m. It's usually done by 9:15, so the next job kicks off at 9:20. Oops, it didn't run. Something failed, and then the whole thing comes crashing down, right? All those assumptions. Have you um, heard about the that was designed for this? I'm, I'm not. You can't put every necessarily everything in. Right? Sometimes you've got, you know, maybe an external entity sends you a file via FTP, and that is supposed to be there at a certain time, right? You can't necessarily put that in your Uzi. Yes, you can. All right. You can, you can wait, you put a file to All right, well, we're not talking about Uzi. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the case with yeah. the pull uh, model, right? If you use the push model, this won't happen, right? I'm sorry, say that again? This is the case with the pull model, right? The agent is trying to tell the log to get the use. Right, so, it, you know, Flume, the Flume NG stands for next generation. The Flume actually went through a rewrite. The first version of Flume actually had a tail source that did this. Um, and they dropped it for exactly this reason, because there was no way to really give that kind of, those kinds of guarantees, right? Um, you don't know if they're running out of disk space. You don't know if this file rotation is ha happening. Um, so yeah, generally you want to avoid this kind of this kind of handoff. Uh, so the lesson is don't use tail, right? Um, but when you really, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're using like tail and handing off through the file, or if you're using like you know a queue that holds the records for some amount of time and you don't pick them up fast enough, right? You, you want to avoid these kind of situations where where the handoff is just assumed to happen in a certain amount of time. Um, you just save yourself some headache. Um, so now you're kind of in this situation where, well, what can I use, right? And well, you can use that lock to J appender, right? Because you're pushing the data in as opposed to you know, doing this, this periodic pull. But maybe this isn't an option, right? Maybe you're trying to, um, you know, you want to pick your Apache logs. You don't really control, you're not going to go write log for J into you know, Apache or something like that. Um, you've got a directory files. What do you do? So, in more recent versions of Flume, they created this thing called the Spoon Directory Source, where you configure it to point it at a directory that says, any file in this directory, send down the pipe, right? Send to, send to my channel, and when you're done with it, delete it, right? But what this means is that that directory can't be the directory that you're currently writing to, right? Because the files in there have to be sort of closed and done, right? So if you're gonna do something like this, I would say do something like, use this in conjunction with something like log rotate to, when you rotate the logs, move them from where they're actively being written to into the school directory, and then let this thing pick up the file, send it, and delete it, right? Um, uh, but, you know, of course, alternatively, be, you know, you can have, when log rotate does the log rotation, you can actually just have a call of the Avro client to send the data into an Avro source. Um, so it's, it's kind of to you. I'm sure there's lots of other ways. Um, 
Uh, one thing to mention, uh, I found this. I found this great picture. Uh, this is like a comparison of like you know RAM speed versus disk speed. Um, this kind of goes back to part of this is about well, which channel do you pick and things like that. You know, if you're picking up files from a directory and then writing them into a, a local film agent, which is then going to relay them. Um, you know, if you use a file channel, you're you're hitting the disk once to you know to write the data. You read it. Flume reads it, or the, the spoon source reads it, then you write it again to the file channel, right? And then it picks it up, and so you're hitting the disk a lot. And if you've got a large file of data, you're just killing the disk. It's even worse if you're in like a virtual shared environment where the disk is shared. Um, so it may not, you know, when you ask people, you know, how important is it that I keep every bit of data, right? And they say, oh my god, this is, this is totally important. You can't lose any data, right? And then you figure out how much hardware you're actually going to need, right? Even if you go buy like SSDs now, because SSDs get cheaper, but you're going to wear those SSDs out with this kind of workflow because the data is always churning, right? Um, so oftentimes, if you figure out just how much hardware you need to meet that kind of requirement, you go back and say, "Oh, you're going to need you know a million dollars of hardware." A lot of times, the requirement will change. Um, so uh, don't feel bad about pushing back if, uh, if when they, when they uh, ask you for sort of really crazy um, requirements like that. Um, and then, of course, the other the other thing that kind of happens uh, with this kind of asynchronous, you know, this kind of multiple machine handoff is that you might actually see something more than once, right? Um, but it turns out that you know trying to have a distributed guarantee that you ever only see some, you know, each individual record just one time. It's really hard to have that kind of guarantee. It's very expensive. It's at, it's much, much, much cheaper just to deal with it when you run your MapReduce job. Just say, look, all the data's here, but there might be some duplicates, so work that into your MapReduce job. Um, and that's, it's just way easier to deal with it that way. Um, a lot of times there's often you either deal with it in the query, or you deal with it um, if you do like a um, uh, like a scrubbing phase. Like sometimes, uh, if you're streaming the data in and you're kind of compressing it on the fly, you might not get very good compression because you're only compressing, let's say, a minute's worth of data, right? But then if you take that whole, if you come back later and take that whole hour of data, all those little tiny files, which you kind of want to do anyway, right? You want bigger files in the HDFS. Um, you come back and you kind of squish them all into one file. It'll compress better. And that's a perfect time to get rid of duplicates, right? So that's also something to consider. Um, you can also have late data, right? And this kind of comes back to some of the reporting chains and things like that. It's like, you know, you might have, you know, data might show up late. And so if people are running reports or queries that kind of then populate either hive tables or, you know, email or report out or whatever you do, you, know, you might have these situations where data might be stuck somewhere, either because something's just in a bad way and it stopped sending data, little network lifts, whatever. Um, so, you know, again, if you if you need that instantaneous, absolute guarantee of delivery, use a database. Don't use this um, or any any of the sort of variants of this, right? Because um, I know there's there's others out there. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, this is also assuming you even know that there's a problem, right? There's so much data flying around. It's coming from hundreds, thousands of machines. How do you even know, right? So monitoring becomes very, very important, right? Um, so this is a this is a snapshot of, um, of uh, I just took this. This is uh, some the amount of data uh, that is being uh, going through a Flume agent that I'm sending into our, our Graphite server. Um, and this is just a way for me to say, hey, look, there's a problem here. And I know which box it's happening to. Um, you want to try, however you want to do your monitoring, you want to make sure that you can deal with situations like this where it's not just the process is running, the process is not running. Because most of the time, the problems are the process is running, but it's not doing anything, right? Um, whatever it is, right? And most of the time, it's not necessarily even a problem with Loom or anything like that, it's it's whatever it's sending it to, right? Because this whole thing is just a big pipe. And somewhere in that pipeline, there's a jam, 
um, and it backs up. And so you want to catch that early because, especially if you have a lot of data, you have a very small time window before those channels fill up and the data starts to get dropped. Um, I have a related question. Yeah. So we don't want the channel to fill uh, soon, right? So we need to configure configure our sync frequency to pull the data as soon as possible, right? But when we do that, then we end up creating so many SDFS files. Uh, is, there a, any, is there any support available in Flu to um, avoid creating so many HDFS files during sync process? Well, post concatenation or something. Well, so the, the sync is going to try and pull data out as soon as it's put in the channel. Like basically, it's sitting there and says, Give me a record, you got nothing, I'm going to block. And then as soon as one shows up, he gets notified and tries to send it to HDFS. If there's an open file, he'll write to it, right, and then that rotation period comes into play. If the file's not open yet, it'll open a new file and start writing to it, and then when the rotation time or whatever happens, it will then close the file. So you do have to make that trade off, because obviously you don't want to keep that file open for a really, really long time, because, you know, if something goes wrong, we wind up with a zero length file of nothing, right? Um, but to your point, you also don't want lots and lots of tiny files because it's going to be really inefficient. Uh, you, you have to pick some balance if you're dealing with HDFS, some balance, right? Um, if you think about like what HBase does under the hood, it kind of deals with this problem automatically, um, you know, where you write a bunch of data, it goes into the mem store, it writes into tiny little files, and then it has the compaction, right? But you know, they built that in as, as the way to deal with tiny files, and the format of the data is the H file format, right? Here, the format could be anything, right? So, uh, I, I wrote my own recompressed, you know, recompressed MapReduce job that understands my format, understands what a duplicate looks like, right? Um, I don't know if there's really a way to kind of build that in um, for arbitrary data, right? Um, so I think you just have to pick a balance somewhere between, um, you know, not too, you don't want to keep the files open too long, because if there's a problem, it might, it might just disappear. Um, but at the same time, you don't want them closing so often that you're creating, because you create a lot of stress on the system if you're creating a lot of tiny files, it, it has to reopen sockets, it has to you know, manage all that stuff. It just, I don't have a good answer for that, it, because it depends. Right? It depends on the, on the workflow. Um, so however you want to do any monitoring, make sure you have it in place. Make sure you know how to detect when something goes wrong and you know, how to react quickly. Because, you know, if, and, and again, it kind of depends on your, on, your, on your data rate. If you're not creating a crazy amount of data, um, you know, we've had pre-production systems that you know, it'll, it'll queue up two weeks worth of data, and it's not, you know, barely even, you know, scratch. But production will fill up in, you know, under a minute. So, if uh, if things back up, so um, it depends. Um, and then, you know, there's, you know, there's other things to consider also, right? Like some of the stuff we already mentioned, like number of files, right? When you when you're dealing with like file channels or or even HDFS. Um, you know, there's only so many files you can have open at a time. You need to deal with disk space. You've got a lot of discontention, especially in virtual space. Uh, um, how much realistic speed you can get. Um, since the sync is, um, you know, you have one thing pulling data off the sync and writing it to the HDFS file. For that one HDFS file, you know, the, the data is going serially. There's not a real way to speed that up unless you have two that are writing to two files at the same time. But then you got to have two syncs and you got to have um, two channels, and it gets more complicated. But um, you know, you need to think about all that kind of stuff. Uh, you've also got the situation of, of sockets, right? If you've got you know, a thousand machines all sending it to this one, you know, Flume agent. You, even though even if the data volume is low, you might just have way too many sockets coming in. There's a finite number of sockets that you know a machine can handle. Um, so you may actually need to tier them, right? So you have half the machines go to one machine, half the machine, half half of your servers go to another machine, and then those two go to a 
a central machine LL, then you, at that point you probably just run them straight to HDFS. Um, and then of course, number of hops, right? Every, every, every time when you start tiering things, or maybe even without the tiers, maybe depending on data center separation or other, other concerns, um, you know, every hop is a place for something to go wrong. You've got another, another agent running, it has, you know, it's a program, it could run out of memory, it could be in a server that crashes, right? Um, so you don't want to have too many hops um, if you can avoid it. Um, and of course, uh, this, uh, you guys are probably familiar with this uh, Maslow's hammer, right? Where, you know, everybody says, that produces this big giant hammer that you, you know, big, bring your big data problem. Right? You need to remember that, you know, uh, even Flume is, is, you know, it's not a solution for everything. Not everything's a nail when you have a big hammer. Um, it's great for moving data from here to there. It's really good, you know, it can do some minor, tra you know, some transformations in flight, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, what if I wanted to compute like an average, right? You can't, you can't really do that. It, it, I mean, you, you could probably, but you'd probably wind up re-implementing something that you can get for free just by looking at a more appropriate project. So if you need to do things like computation on the fly, as opposed to waiting for, you know, kind of doing a MapReduce once it's been written, Take a look at one of the stream processing things. There's Storm is very popular. Like it's got the SAMHSA project. It's very similar. Um, and you know, just use the right tool for the right job. Uh, I'm sorry. Is it how old is this slide? How what? Old is this slide? How old is this slide? I don't know. A week? Why? <laughs> Storm is Apache now. Is it Apache now? Yeah. Well, it came from Twitter, right? Right, but yeah. it's about a year long in Apache supported by Porter. Well, yeah, sorry, I, I'm clearly I'm behind the times. <laughs> Thank you. Storm is Apache now. I'm sure Samsung will eventually be Apache too. Everything eventually becomes Apache, right? Yeah. Um, so that's it. Uh, um, so uh, here's a link to the slides, um, but I'll I'll send the link to uh, to uh, you guys as well. Um, any questions? Are you giving away your book? Am I giving away my book? Um, <laughs> You know, you know, I actually don't even have a copy of my book with me. I, I only got, I got, three, I got three copies uh, after I wrote it, and, uh, and I gave, uh, I gave uh, one to my wife, and one to my parents, one to my, um, one to my brother, and That's how you value Hadoop user group? What's that? That's how you value Chicago Diffuser. I do value Chicago Diffuser. Group. Well, now you know why it took me so long to actually get up in front of you and, uh, and give a talk. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry I don't have a free book. Um, um, I, you know, I don't even have a discount code or anything because uh, I would have to pay. I basically pay you to buy my book. So this would have been an excellent promotion for you. You're right, I feel it. <laughs> so, um, anyway, um, anybody have any questions? No? All right. Thanks. Um, this uh, fun. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think so. Do you know how to switch this thing off? Yeah. Sure. 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 Sure.